Half a day. Welcome to episode four of Pacific Level Up. And I'm really excited today because I'm not doing this all on my own. Joining me is a good friend of mine from Guam. Um, his name is Dr. Keith Camacho. He's an associate professor at the University of California, Los Angeles. And he's from a special place in Guam called Jigo. So he really knows what we need to know about Micronesia and he's going to walk us through that. This, just to remind you, is a COVID-19 response, um, Pacific Level Up. You can check out the other uh, episodes online or go to our website for further learning resources. Now, today's episode is called Meet Micronesia. We're going to meet Micronesia using the knowledge of Keith Camacho. And he's going to tell us 10 things we need to know about Micronesia. Now, a quick recap. This is Micronesia, the northern Pacific that runs from the far west to the central Pacific and has all these nations and Keith's going to walk us through these. And with that, I'll hand over and start talking to Keith. Half a day. Uh, my name is Keith Camacho and I'm Associate Professor at UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles. Um, I was born and raised in Guam, uh, the southernmost island in the Marianas Archipelago. Um, and one of um, several uh, cultural groups in Micronesia. So I'm a Chamorro person from this part of the world. Um, and I'm excited to be part of this um, interview, educational seminar uh, for the Auckland youth. Uh, let's talk about these top 10 things you should know about this region. First, Micronesia is an area comprised of diverse nation states, diverse peoples, diverse territories. Uh, it's one of three regions in Oceania, the other two being Polynesia and Melanesia. Uh, and the nation states and territories that uh, are involved include the United States Commonwealth or the Northern Mariana Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Republic of Palau, and the United States Unincorporated Territory of Guam. So that's kind of a mouthful, right? I mean, Republic, territory, uh, all, you really to, all you really need to know is uh, Micronesia is comprised of several island groups, cultural groups. We have Kosrai, Kosraians, we have Chuk, Chukis, we have Palau or Belau, Palauans, we have Yap, Yapis, Pohnpei, Pohnpeians, Mariana Islands, Chamorros, Marshallese uh, from the Marshall Islands, and so on. Historically, uh, we can also consider Kiribati and Nauru as part of Micronesia. And there's many other uh, countries and regions in what we now call Southeast Asia that are historically linked uh, to this part of the world. Uh, but for my top 10 or top six or top three countdown today, we will mainly examine uh, the U.S. Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, the Federated States of the Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, Palau, and Guam. Second, Micronesia boasts many examples of intelligent, courageous, and inspiring women leaders. Her Excellency Hilda Heine, for instance, became the first Marshallese female president of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, an independent nation, in 2016. As the president, uh, Hilda Heine advocated for climate change policies and women's rights in Asia, Europe, and elsewhere. In 2019, the people of Guam, a U.S. territory like American Samoa, elected Lou Leon Guerrero, a Democrat, as the first tomorrow female governor of the island. Governor Leon Guerrero, a former nurse and public official, now leads the island in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic in Guam and greater Micronesia that these two women, that these two women, President Heine and Governor Guerrero, uh, that they became high ranking government officials in Micronesia is not a surprise. The Republic of Palau, an archipelago of 200 islands and atolls serves as another example. There, the Council of Chiefs, a body comprised of men, make decisions concerning everyday life. Yet their political power, their economic power, emanates from women. That is to say, Palauan women distribute land on behalf of their clans, serve as the trustees of family inheritances, elect the chiefs, and if necessary, 
if the chiefs don't listen to them or the chiefs are not fair or loving, the woman can impeach them. So Palawan, Marshallese, Chamorro women embody what we call matrilineal societies, societies where women center a lot of what we think of as the economy or uh, politics, everyday life. Third, diverse navigation traditions inform the seascapes and landscapes of Micronesia. Mao Piailug, perhaps the best known master navigator from Satawal in Micronesia, inspired the making of double, the double hull canoe Hokulea in Hawaii and mentored many Polynesian navigators until his passing in 2010. For the Maori, uh, the Tangata Fenua, for Samoan, for Fijians, anyone who has a, a modern grasp on navigation today, all of us owe our understanding of, of navigation to Mao Pialog and many other navigators from Micronesia. In fact, I met one of them a few years ago in Los Angeles, and we shared a meal at In-N-Out Burger. And so for those of you in Auckland, if you haven't been to In-N-Out Burger, I tell you, you gotta hit up Professor Damon Salesa, get on a travel study, get on that airplane on Air New Zealand, flight number two to LA, baby, and go In-N-Out Burger. So I'm sitting there with this master navigator, right? You know, who goes down the ocean, you know, doesn't need any compass. And you know, this, this guy knows how to fish, he eats turtles, all that kind of stuff. And I ask him two questions. One, what's your favorite food, Lino? And Lino, uh, uh, by way of background, Lino Olopai, he's, he's Carolinian or Refelawash from Saipan in the Mariana Islands. But Carolinians and Chamorros and Chukis and Samoans and Tahitians, we've long, know, knew each other for a long, long time. I said, what's your favorite food? And what's your furthest you know, reach? Where, where have you traveled the farthest as a navigator? What do you know about that? So his first food, he said, oh, my favorite food is McDonald's Big Mac. And then he says, in and out burger, it's okay. So the second thing he said, for nav as for navigation, more seriously, he said, he knew how to navigate. He could navigate and has navigated between Saipan and Chuk, or between Chuk and Guam. So he knows how to move. And he goes, oh yeah, we can even travel far to, uh, to what you call Japan or what you call Australia. And I say, do you navigators actually say Australia and Japan? He goes, no, we only have songs of the birds and the fish and the stars. And that tells us how to get to certain places. So check that out, Lino, navigator, you know, lover of birds, stars, and fish, but also a lover of the Big Mac. Fourth, Christianity is the dominant religion in Micronesia. Christianity is the dominant religion. Fourth uh, thing you need to know about Micronesia. Catholicism is the largest uh, Christian group, but we also have Protestants, Mormons, and others. There's also a small collective of Muslims in Guam. And while Catholicism arrived in Micronesia by way of Spanish uh, Jesuits in the 1600s, it will be the English, Germans, and even Native Hawaiians of the 1800s that will bring uh, other Christian domination. So Christianity, Catholicism, healing, love, very important in Micronesia. Fifth, many people in Micronesia enjoy sharing and chewing biru nut. What is biru nut? In the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands, in Guam, in Palau, in Yap, many families grow betel nut trees. In my house, in Guam, in Jigo, I got betel nut trees behind my house. All right, and there's the young, what they call the young kind and the old kind. You go through all of my, all of Micronesia, they're, they're, the, the reference is really one of two things. A young betel nut, which when you chew, um, uh, you have to, it, 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 um, yeah, a lot of juice comes out, they keep spitting it. Uh, or if it's dry, you can chew it and eat it. So tomorrow's uh, Panapeans, Yapis, uh, Palauans, and other islanders in Micronesia love beetle nut. And um, it gives you a, a slight high, you know, but it's, it's like a kind of high where uh, you can still work and talk. It's not like Sakao in um, Ponpe, which is a muscle relaxant, or Ava, muscle relaxants, you know, you really, you can be really uh, relaxed that way. With a uh, beetle nut, you can, it's a, it's a, it's, people in Micronesia chew it because of its sociality. And so if you go to any store in Micronesia, 
right? You're going to see at the, at the reg reg register of the cashier several things. Bubble gum. Uh, you're going to see homemade donuts. You're going to see cigarettes. And you're going to see beetle nut, all kinds of beetle nut, and all kinds of beetle leaves, and all kinds of lime. And you can chew them together. Uh, and so beetle nut is another thing you should know about Micronesia. Uh, six, and relatedly, Micronesians uh, have become dependent upon imported foods. So unlike the beetle nut, a locally grown, uh, a locally grown item, spam, uh, is a very popular but important item in Micronesia. Um, even spam company at one point said that Guam, um, per capita, uh, consumes the most spam in the world. And that statistic um, is only rivaled uh, by Hawaii and Okinawa, right? Why I mentioned, I, I put um, spam down as a sixth thing you should know about Micronesia for several things. Not only because it's such a popular food item, it's a ceremonial item, ceremonial item. People exchange it, chiefs exchange it, uh, uh, weddings, people give it as gifts. So it has a lot of ceremony about this modest tin can, the sociality, people love to eat it and talk. One time I was in Guam, I was going to do an errand and I came by to a friend's house and this young nine-year-old boy is walking out, no t-shirt, his shorts and his flip-flops and he has like this whole chunk of spam and he's eating it like it's candy, right? So it's, it's ubiquitous, spam is ubiquitous. But more seriously, you know, you're in high school, you're in, in social studies, you're talking about economics, et cetera. Spam is a micro, microcosm of economic dependency. So Micronesians are consuming and buying uh, economies from the outside. We're supporting economies from the outside. So I raise spam as a very serious note, not only for how it's appreciated in ceremonial and everyday usage in Micronesia, but also as a microcosm of the challenges Micronesians face when it comes to creating economic interdependency rather than economic dependency. Right? Spam came by way of the military in World War II, not just to Guam, but to uh, South Korea, or now, what we now call South Korea, and Hawaii, and other places, Okinawa. But because of the U.S. military um, and its relationship to spam, you know, that is the seventh thing you, sh you should know about Micronesia. And that is the United States retains much um, economic, um, diplomatic, and political control of the region. So even though we have uh, countries like the Republic of the Marshall Islands, Republic of Palau, um, you know, Federated States of Micronesia. These countries vote at the United Nations. These countries uh, have bilateral, multilateral agreements with so many entities. But even though these countries, which are independent on the surface, uh, the United, they ultimately owe their sovereignty to the United States. What does that mean? What does sovereignty mean? Sovereignty is like that, that young kid I talked about who just grabbed that piece of spam in Guam and was chewing on it like it was candy. That's his own sovereignty. He, wanted, he decided he wanted to eat spam. I enjoy it. I'm going to eat it. That's my decision. At the political level in Micronesia, the sovereignty is superficial because the United States has either a treaty agreement or total unilateral rights to the land, seas, and skies of Micronesia. Let's begin with the former treaty agreement. The Compact of Free Association, also colloquially known as COFA, allows the United States to control the air, land, and sky, uh, the sea, etc., of Micronesia, Micronesia's independent countries in times of war, in perpetuity. Now, this treaty agreement works both ways. Because the United States can unilaterally, through treaty, govern, my, govern independent Micronesia, Marshallese, Palauans, and um, Khosrowans, other communities under these independent nation states can travel without restriction in any part of the United States. They can travel, they can seek employment, they can seek education, 
so they do not need visas. But the trade-off is the U.S. government has total control, military control of all of Micronesia. Eighth, contemporary Micronesian patterns to the U.S. continent rival older um, migration routes. That is to say, since the 1950s, an increasing number of Micronesians have migrated to places like Seattle, uh, San Diego, uh, Oakland, also San Francisco. And yes, why? A lot of them are migrating mainly because of the U.S. military. I mean, even in Pongo Pongo in American Samoa, you had the Fita Fita, you had soldiers traveling to Honolulu uh, and then to San Diego, and yet tomorrow is coming from Guam, migrating to uh, San Diego, to Georgia, Fort Benning, all these military sites, all these military sites, and all for a lot of complex reasons. You know, some young kids just wanted to be adventurous. Some people felt they owe an obligation to the United States. Some people have all these different motivations. They want to be closer to their, their cousin, their mate, who moved to San Diego, and they're like, I want to join the military so I can be closer to them. So a lot of times, it's not because of military service that these young Micronesians are joining the military. There's a lot of familial, individual, cultural, collective aspiration in that migration pattern. And from 1950s to 60s, 70s, a lot of those migrants were mainly Chamorro soldiers, Samoan sailors, Samoan soldiers, traveling from Micronesia and from Pongo Pongo in these circuits to the continental United States. It's only after Kofa in Micronesia where you see increased migration in the late 80s going throughout all parts of the United States where Chukis and, and um, Marshallese and other communities are migrating in unprecedented ways and really creating new routes, creating new identities, and so on. Ninth, a diverse range of social movements uh, have been taking place in Micronesia. Uh, for those of you who know a lot about uh, maritime law, the U.S. government tested more than 60 uh, bombs, nuclear bombs, in the Marshall Islands. Uh, but a lot of scholars out there um, say, uh, they use this phrase called the Anthropocene, right? Big word, big word. Go, go to your teacher down the street and say, hey, teacher, you know what Anthropocene means? And so Anthropocene, uh, what what it comes down to is the idea that humans, people like you and me, can, can cause so much change in the earth that what we do affects how the earth uh, turns out. So Anthropocene is a question of like, where in human history did humans cause uh, these things like climate change? And one big part of that is the nuclear testing in Micronesia, U.S. nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands, but also French nuclear testing in Morua, in French Polynesia, uh, Australian uh, nuclear testing in Aboriginal lands, Aboriginal country. When you put all these things together, right, you have a kind of jump starting to climate change, right, of all the nuclear emissions, all the radiation, climate change. Well, subsequently, there's been a climate change social movement in, in Micronesia and the greater Pacific, Kiribati. Tuvalu, you know, the, the atolls most severely affected by um, these changes. So throughout Micronesia, when you go, the, when you, when you go there and you visit there, there's, there's a consciousness, even for people that might be skeptical of climate change, there's a consciousness about climate change justice. Finally, uh, the, the 10th thing you should know about uh, Micronesia is that young people like yourself are those change makers that you know what's really beautiful to see is that you have increasing numbers of young uh artists young hip-hop uh dancers uh young uh poets um i mean really taking the global stage and doing their thing as we say in la they're doing their thing and i feel uh that is the 10th thing you 10th thing you should know about micronesia and and it is has to do with the uh, incredible range of young artists, uh, educators, um, you name it, coming out and, and really doing their stuff uh, and making Micronesia and Greater Oceania uh, uh, proud. So yeah, if you have any other questions, just hit me up, you know.
I'm at kcamacho at ucla.edu. I want to give a shout to my USO, you know, Professor Damon Salesa. I want to give a shout to all the uh, peoples of Oklani. Hey, major props to you people. I, I know you kids are we're repping it every day. We're repping it every day. So, man, love to all of you and your families. And take care of yourself during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So, just Masi, and thank you. So, a big thank you to Dr. Keith Camacho, Associate Professor at the University of California, Los Angeles. Thanks so much for giving us this knowledge and telling us about a part of the Pacific that is too little known and way too little understood and appreciated, especially in the South Pacific. So join us next time for Melanesia 101, Episode 5 of Pacific Level Up.